I'm a trial lawyer today because my gift, my calling, so to speak, uh, was to end up in a courtroom. I started out as a prosecutor, wanted to learn how to try cases, and developed a love for the notion of being able to go into a courtroom and represent somebody in a, even in a, a criminal case, a criminal defense case, or a civil case and bring a just result for that family, that person, that individual who's harmed. The lives of our clients have been changed by virtually every case, every case we do in, in one way or another. Sometimes it's money, sometimes it's the change of a rule, sometimes it's only their day in court and a chance at justice. Our work, after all, is about justice in the courtroom and about changing the lives of every single one of our clients for the better. That's the hope, the mission that we have every time we walk into a courtroom or take a case for someone that we're going to be able to help them and make a difference, a positive difference in their life. Every day in courtrooms across the country, people grapple with the endless variety of human evil, nobility, error, stupidity, and bravery. Because the oath to tell the truth is taken seriously by some people in courtrooms from the biggest cities to the smallest towns, courtroom battles can offer unusually clear glimpses of American life, even the parts that stubbornly defy explanation. In this country, our courts are the great levelers. In our courts, all men are created equal. We do not have to be idealists to believe firmly in the integrity of our courts and of our jury system. That's no ideal to us. That is a living, working reality. Today, the Insider Exclusive goes behind the headlines in Russian Roulette, Carl Keller's story to examine how Victor Probanik, founding member of Probanik and Probanik, got justice in a wrongful death lawsuit arising out of a deadly game of Russian Roulette when a high school senior prodded Carl Keller, a ninth grader, to his death with a 357 Magnum. Filing a claim for wrongful death arising out of inducing another to engage in a game of Russian roulette was a novel approach to justice. But Victor Probanik's law firm believed it was appropriate given the terrible consequences and the fact that the older individual had clearly precipitated and clearly provoked the episode and should be held responsible. The case was successfully settled during jury deliberations after a week-long trial. Victor Probanik has earned the highest respect from citizens and lawyers alike as one of the best trial lawyers in White Oak, in Pennsylvania, and in the United States. He has seen many innocent, hardworking people suffer needless injury. And because of that, he is driven to help other people who have been harmed by the negligent actions of others. His goals, not only to get justice for Carl Keller and his family, but to make sure everyone follows the laws and are held accountable when they violate them. Victor has built a substantial reputation by consistently winning cases other law firms have turned down. His amazing courtroom skills and headline-grabbing success rate continue to provide his clients with the results they need and the results they deserve. This is the Insider Exclusive, live from White Oak, Pennsylvania. It is my great pleasure to introduce Victor Probanik to the show. Welcome to the show, Victor. Thank you, Steve. Tell our audience a little bit about your practice of law here in White Oak, Pennsylvania. Our firm does uh, trial work, and over the years we've done all kinds of trial work, uh, starting back in the early days with criminal defense work and civil cases. Uh, and uh, currently we do mostly medical negligence cases and many, many uh, other cases where uh, our clients are injured by vehicles, devices, right. uh, whatever. Always representing the little guy, though. Always. 
And, you know, you could have been a lawyer for IBM or Ford Motor Company, but yet you chose to be what is called a plaintiff's lawyer representing the little fella. Yes. Why yes. do you do that? There's many, many reasons for that, Steve. The, the most significant is that uh, unfortunately in our society today, in America today, we, we have a class of people who end up being victims that mm -hmm. are victims of our medical institutions, victims of mostly in some form or another corporate America, products, behaviors, foods, whatever, and from time to time victims of uh, our fellow citizens. And these people have lives that are ravaged by their injuries and, and what happens to them and their loved ones, and they need somebody to, to stand up for them and uh, do what sometimes little can be done to, mm -hmm. to bring a just resolution to a tragic uh, circumstance. Today on this show, we're going to be talking about a tragic case, the case of Carl Keller. Yes. Who was a young man. He was 15, I believe. Correct? Yes. Um, tell our audience a little bit about the facts of this case, because it's rather significant. This was a circumstance, Steve, where a young man, Carl was 15 at the time, was induced invited into playing Russian roulette by an older individual, uh, several years older than he. And uh, tragically, during this, uh, I, would, I would say, coerced game of Russian roulette, Carl lost his life as a result of a bullet wound to his, uh, to his head. We filed suit against the older child, not yet an 18-year-old, but uh, considerably older than Carl by nearly three years, mm -hmm. uh, alleging that he was negligent in having behaved in the way he did, inducing younger Carl to play this game of Russian roulette. Mm -hmm. You went to trial on the case. We did. Ultimately, it was settled, correct? Moments uh, before the case would have been decided by the jury. We went, went to mm -hmm. trial in Indiana County, Pennsylvania, right. and uh, selected a jury up there before Judge Olson. Mm -hmm. And during the jury selection, Steve, the voir dire questions in that county and in many counties in Pennsylvania are conducted by the judge. Mm -hmm. And I recall Judge Olson asking the panel of prospective jurors, how many of you own a gun? And virtually every single hand uh, in the room went up. Right. And uh, that was the group from which we selected our jury. One of the things that anybody looking at this case, because it was on the New York Times, would have to think is uh, you have a 15-year-old boy, you got a 17-year-old boy. Right. The issue of personal responsibility comes up. Surely. So how did you address that to the jury and in the conduct of this trial by making it very clear that the 17-year-old had a duty and a responsibility to um, not encourage this younger boy to do what he did. When we're older, later in our lives, I think we look at a year or two or three as not being landmarks in yeah. our behaviors. The, the difference between a 15-year-old, if you can remember, and uh, I think we can all remember that. And an almost 18-year-old is a world of difference. And we see through history t and, and today, younger <clears throat> children emulating their peers, not because they think it's the right thing to do, not because yeah. it's a smart thing to do, but because of the so-called uh, peer pressure and the inducement to do things, everything from... You know, chasing girls inappropriately to using drugs or whatever. And this is, was a circumstance where I would say we had an influential, relatively older young person who, in my judgment, clearly induced this younger man to place himself in a situation where he was liable to be seriously harmed or lose his life. Do you think that because most of the jurors were gun owners, 
that they looked at it like, yeah, you know, older people should um, teach younger people to respect weapons and not use them in this very deadly fashion. I think the jurors did look at it that way, and there was evidence d during the trial that young Carl, coming from that part of Pennsylvania, rural part of Pennsylvania, had already had a hunting license at age 15, mm. had undergone the required hunter safety course in Pennsylvania, and he knew, clearly he knew, that that was improper behavior with, with a revolver. What was the um, defense's position? What was their strategy? What did they say? It, their strategy was exactly what you suggested. It yeah. was his own choice. It was his own fault. He has. He pulled the trigger. He pulled the trigger. Like any suicide case, I've tried many, not suicide, but any, any self-inflicted death case, like yeah. suicides, the, the simple device on the part of the defense is to, is to blame the plaintiff for what occurred. In a case like this, what are the actual legal issues that are involved? The uh, relative fault of the children, they were both old enough to be capable of negligence. And yeah. The law in Pennsylvania and in most states, at below a certain age, children are presumptively not capable of being negligent. Mm -hmm. uh, they're just not trusted with that. But uh, who was responsible for what? We have a comparative negligence statute in Pennsylvania, so they could apportion whether it was 60% uh, the uh, defendant's fault or 40% Mr. Keller's fault mm -hmm. in, in uh, res uh, causing his own death. Uh, so those were the more significant legal issues, I guess. Do you know, I don't know if you're aware, but since this case, have insurance companies tightened their insurance policies so that they're not liable for cases like this? Or has there been new law passed as a result of this case? Insurance companies, to my knowledge, Steve, have not, uh, the, the word that they use is uh, excluded yeah. uh, liability for this kind of conduct from their policies, as you know from your yeah. uh, interviews over the years with many people involving many cases, often if there's an event where insurance companies perceive big liability in the future, they'll write it right out of the policy. So yeah. you're, you're paying them and not getting protection for right. the, the thing that can happen. This whole case brings up the issue of parent liability child act, yes. which var varies from state to state. Right. What are, for our viewers, what are parents' responsibility with minors in cases like this and other things that they do? In cases like this and other things in our state, in Pennsylvania, and uh, this is the law in most states across the country, mm -hmm. parents are not liable for the conduct of their minor children. And if they are, in Pennsylvania, for instance, there's a, a limit, a very modest $500 or so limit for uh, the responsibility on the part of parents for their children. Yeah, today uh, gun ownership and such is very much in the news. And as in your case, everybody, every one of the jurors owned a gun. What are the liability and the safety issues that gun owners have in their homes, especially around children? Well, surely we all ought to have the ability and right to possess and maintain firearms, but with that goes a responsibility for safe maintenance, storage, etc. In the Keller family, nobody suggested that there was any recklessness or sloppiness on the part of the Keller family in storing or maintaining mm -hmm. the weapons. It was in a safe place. It was accessed by a uh, 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 clever 15-year-old who knew how to find the key to the gun cabinet and get the weapon and so forth. And knowing that he'd been prohibited by his uh, parents uh, not to touch the thing, he nonetheless avoided the storage method. And then there are methods out there today that are pretty fail-safe, trigger locks and so forth that perhaps could have averted this, but nobody suggested that anything was done wrong on the part of the Keller mm -hmm. family. But if you keep in a, gun in a gun in the house, especially a handgun, mm -hmm. which are fascinating to children because of the media and the whatnot. Uh, there are ways today that they can be kept absolutely safely, of course.
Yeah, you mentioned that this case was settled right before it went to the jury, correct? Actually, the jury was deliberating. Yes. And uh, during the, uh, the trial itself, the insurance company had, uh, had offered the uh, policy limits, and we declined those. And actually, it was settled uh, for something beyond that while the jury was deliberating. Yeah, that brings up an interesting question. You know, when you are offered a settlement, obviously you have to go to your client right. and you know see if they want it or not. But in your mind, why would the settlement, the policy limit, not be enough? I don't know what was the what was the policy limit. Uh, I, I don't think. I, I mean, don't. most insurance. Let's just theoretically say most insurance policy limits are like two hundred fifty thousand dollars for whatever. You know, for homeowner insurance, and that's the the insurance company that was at stake, right? Mm -hmm. But in your mind, when do you decide that, based on your client, what do you recommend to your client, whether a settlement is better than waiting for a jury verdict? Well, first and foremost, that's a client uh, a client decision. It's a yeah. it's a decision that I always and I, I think we must leave to the clients with our input and. People that decline or turn down uh, significant sums that are offered in settlement during yeah. trials do so for reasons of rightness and rectitude and justice and wanting somebody to speak about a tragedy or an important thing in, yeah. in, in their lives. Uh, and I. I, I believe that's what happened with the Kellers. This is a case that a lot of lawyers probably would, would not have taken. You can count on that. Yeah. <laughs> Why did you decide to take this case? Because it is a difficult case to prove. It is. And it's establishing almost new law. It's, yes. You know, it's testing the limits. Why did you decide to take the case? In looking at the circumstances and talking to young Carl's surviving family, uh, it reminded me of the the terrible things that young people, older young people can do in situations that they, they can create uh, with uh, their, their younger people. You know, there's, we all grew up with bullies. We all grew up with kids who induced other children to do wrong things. And mm -hmm. this was a, a situation where that had gone way beyond the, way beyond the pale. And, uh, and there, at that time in Pennsylvania, there was a, a spate of uh, teenage deaths and shootings, suicides and whatnot. And I thought it was an important case to bring to the forefront because of the, the, the tragedy that occurred most of all and uh, the ability to maybe do something about uh, the behaviors. Well, I want to thank you personally for taking on the case, because as I said, most lawyers wouldn't have taken the case. And congratulations for you know winning the case. And we want to thank you very much for spending time with us on this show. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for joining us. You can get more information about our guests and the issues at InsiderExclusive.com.